Hi, Bernard. Hi, Carsten. This is our third, third video series. So this is maybe the time to give us a, how you said, a sound. <laughs> yeah, you want to have, we want to celebrate something? Yeah, we want to celebrate. <laughs> okay. No, um, hello, everyone. We thought that this topic might be a good one in order to, um, to get some information out to you folks, because it has been um, widely discussed. Um, and there will probably be some news to it in the future. Yeah. Um, but I think for the current state, which is um, September 2023, um, we'll do a series about Azure Stack HCI in a stretch cluster scenario. Yeah, and we will we will uh, include other our other series because we did already an Azure Stack HCI installation series with a non-stretch cluster. So we right. will not redo everything we have to do. Of course, you have to install the nodes. You have to domain join them and so on. We will include only the parts that are separate or, or different in a stretch cluster scenario. Um, yeah. And we will refer to the other series. So um, yeah. So I think Bernard. for most of the people, I mean, it's you know a valid discussion when they would ever consider a stretch cluster scenario. So I think before we dive into the technical stuff and really do the implementation, um, bear with us. We need to talk a little bit about some concepts here and why we are why we would ever use or you know uh, recommend to use a stretch cluster. Yeah. So maybe Carson, I have a question, take... Bernard. Mm -hmm. Who are we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my name is Bernard Frank. Um, I'm working for Microsoft. Um, so I'm a little bit biased here. If you watch this, uh, I'm a fan of Azure Stack HCI, but I also want to, um, you know, tell uh, the folks out there um, my experiences that I have with the product uh, throughout my customer projects. Um, and that's what we do here at Fast Track. We help customers, you know, to take the fast lane to uh, to Azure. And Azure Stack HCI is a part of it. But now to you, over to you, Carsten. Who are yeah. you? My name is Carsten Rachfall. I'm a Microsoft MVP, most relevant professional uh, in the Cloud and Data Center Management Group. I uh, And also in the Azure uh, Group, so fantastic. I'm, I'm the hybrid man maybe, but my Twitter handle is Hyper-V Server, so maybe I have to change that. Um, I'm doing, uh, or my company is doing Azure Stack HCI uh, storage bases direct and uh, Hyper-V installations. And I'm from Germany and Germany is the stretched country. So here <laughs> everything is stretched, not everything, but uh, I, hear, I hear from many people that you stretch things in Germany where other countries don't think about stretching the stuff uh, yet. So uh, I have a lot of experience with stretched uh, scenarios um, and I've done multiple Azure Stack HCI stretched clusters in the last two years. And uh, we want to share our experience, also the experience I made uh, at customers and the installation is most of the stuff how I prefer to do it. It's not all the Microsoft way. Uh, Microsoft, uh, um, Bernard is a Microsoft way, but we will say what is in addition, what I do at customers uh, to get more redundancy or whatever. So, but uh, before we dive into the stuff, we want mm -hmm. to talk a bit about what is a stretch cluster. Yeah, correct. So, um, so this is my slide, Bernard. Uh, why stretch clusters? Um, and by the way, the um, the uh, photos that are used, the pictures that are used, are royalty free. Free. They are from Pix Pixabay or so. Um, mm -hmm. um, so nowadays, in many customer scenarios, the data in the VMs is uh, very valuable uh, to the business, uh, even if they lose minutes or they have to go back to a restore from a backup, they they uh, lose a lot of time and also money in the company. So uh, the data is very, very, very important. Um, there are some companies out there and they're getting more and more uh, who depend on the data nearly 24 by seven. And there are even some com companies who are working 365 days a year. I have such customers where not even one day in the year the production uh, can be shut down because of uh, di different uh, reasons. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, a stretch cluster can protect us against a local disaster. And uh, now 
there are different kinds of local disaster. For example, in Germany, a local disaster would be a, a fire of a building. Yeah? Mm. Normally, we don't have fire that, that spreads over large regions or we don't have earthquakes here. Well, mm. We don't have volcanoes in Germany, at least. Uh, in <laughs> Europe, there are some. Um, yeah. And if you look at the US, for example, they have much larger disasters. So in, imagine we have this, these hurricanes in the hurricane season. Mm. Um, there is not a good advice if you have two rooms on the same the same building or two rooms at the same campus and the hurricane hits uh, they are yeah. maybe both gone yeah so uh, the us has different or there are regions on the earth where they have different uh, catastrophes that we have for example in europe europe is quite so far as now it's 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 quite easy here yeah? <laughs> it's a safe place but it's a you know, safe you have, place yeah. you i mean there are, you know uh, disasters could be everything like flooding we do have flooding uh, you yeah, know in have. germany but also you know um, i mean we do have a lot of companies that are producing stuff and they may have different you know subsidiaries and you know there's a lot of construction work going on and you know um if you have someone you know digging into the road and crashing your internet cable then uh, that or i would call it also as a as a disaster so yeah this can happen here as well right yeah. so with the stretch cluster we want to have multiple sites in mm -hmm. the azure stack hci stretch cluster scenarios we are talking about two sites not three sites or four two sites mm -hmm. And if one of those sites is hit, and we talk about what a site is, um, we want our workloads to start immediately or nearly immediately on the other side. So if one site fails, could be a room, a building, whatever, um, we want our workload as soon as possible running on the other side. And the workload that is in the other side should, shouldn't be impacted. Yeah? So we have like a dis if a disaster hits or power outage hits, um, we want our workload as soon as possible uh, online again. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some requirements where, where we have to use a stretched cluster in Germany, and I'm pretty sure in other countries there are also uh, similar requirements. So for example, if you have the financial sector, banks and so on, they uh, they have to oblige search certain rules and they have to stretch the data between data centers. I worked for, for some data cent, uh, uh, bank data centers and they have to go over 10 kilometers between the sites. That's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's a requirement by uh, a, a regulator. There mm -hmm. are insurance companies, for example, they have the same requirements. Um, and there is also critical infrastructure. So if you are producing something that is critical, uh, for example, some foods or so, you have also to oblige those uh, requirements and you are required to not have all your eggs in one basket, meaning mm. all your data in one room or all your data in one site. So you have to do a stretch cluster. Mm -hmm. So Bernard, some requirements for stretch cluster, and that's you, right? Yes. Um, so as for uh, September 2023 with um, Azure Stack HCI 22H2, which is our current version at this time when we are recording that session, the technical requirements is a minimum of four nodes, right? So you need to have two nodes, uh, two nodes on each side, uh, in order to get that up and running, and as you are replicating the data uh, from one side to the other, you need to have a high-speed network that is capable of you know, transporting um, or has enough bandwidth in order to transport everything that has been changing on one side to the other side, right? And vice versa. Um, and so not a good idea to do it with a one gigabit adapter that is shared by other people as well, no. right? So not a good idea. The other thing is um, you need to take care of the witness or where to place the witness um, as a third, you know, sort of gatekeeper or quorum if you want to, because, um, and we'll talk about that later, it might not be a good idea to put the witness on either side or on one of the sites, right? Uh, so it needs to be an independent location. Yes, um, and 
most important, uh, there's a caveat to this. Um, as of September now, where we are doing this video series, which kind of features are supported on a stretch cluster? Um, VMs that was Carsten was indicating or was showing that is supported. Um, Software-defined networking. So in order to span a software-defined network over the two sites is currently not supported, right? The other thing, and that's maybe not so nice to hear for some of you folks, is Azure Kubernetes Services, AKS on HCI, um, is not supported on a stretched environment at the moment. That might change in the future, but as of today, um, it is not supported, right? So you cannot run mm. a geo-redundant Kubernetes workload on HCI at this stage, right? Mm. So. Um, and there are if you're asking, yeah, let me just yeah. add, uh, sorry for interrupting. Um, and True. if you're asking yourself, how are you providing then the geo redundancy for AKS systems? That's what we say is um, rely on AKS itself and mechanisms that are within AKS or Kubernetes that can be used in order to, you know, um, distribute the workload um, from you know, so that you have two clusters, one in one side and one in the other side, and then you are replicating mm -hmm. your data in order to provide geo redundancy. But don't think it from an HCI perspective at, yeah. at this stage. And if you hear somewhere that is, it, it's possible to do SDN and also AKS in a stretch cluster, of course, but the, the uh, software defined networking or AKS mm -hmm. is not aware that it's stretched. And so it can't, AKS, for example, can't put the different, uh, workloads in different uh, different sites uh, so i'm pretty sure they're working on that but in the moment uh and it said it's september 2023 mm -hmm. it's not supported and uh let's go let's go on we have a lot of uh, information to say to share so um we have two designs uh, of a stretch cluster. So uh, Bernard also already mentioned, we have to have at least four nodes in our stretch cluster, uh, two in each side. And uh, we have a local pool of the devices that, that are in these two servers. And here we have the same, so we have two pools. And uh, this scenario is the active passive scenario. So all our VMs are, running on inside one and they are they are writing and reading all the data of volumes cluster shared volumes that are completely presented in this site on those two nodes on the devices of those two nodes but we want to have a stretch cluster so we have storage replication and we will talk about storage replication in, in a slide a bit later and we replicate the volume here to the passive side and all data that is written here is also on this side so in the event of a cat catastrophe inside one the cluster will switch over all all the the volumes or the volumes will be brought online inside two and the vms will be started inside two bernard has an addition here bernard, please. yes so or maybe a question right um or may, it might be an obvious question right is a stretch cluster scenario cheaper you know or you know in terms no. of hardware hardware <laughs> requirements no Obviously not, no. because you need to have the same amount of storage on the other side as well, right? And the same amount of compute in order to be able to run on the other side. I mean, it yeah. might sound obvious, right? But if you ever do a calculation for it, you need to multiply it by two. Yeah. So uh, you are completely right. We also want some redundancy on this side. So we will at least, our volumes here will at least have a two-way mirror, maybe even a four-way mirror. And if you have a four-way mirror here, you have also four-way mirror here. So the design of the volumes is the same. We would have eight copies of the data. So um, I've seen uh, customers asking, isn't that too much? So let's do a two-way mirror for this volume. And then we have another two copies on this side. So this is already four copies that you mentioned. It's doubled, but if you go for four copies on each side, we would have eight copies. And you have, of course, to think of that. And even the active passive scenario is more expensive because everything is running on these two servers and these servers are only there if you have a disaster. So you don't use these, these servers for workload. 
And that is uh, the perfect segue to the next scenario, that is the active-active design. So we have again a stretch cluster here, and uh, you see the servers that are behind here, not perfectly aligned, but doesn't matter. So we have our four node stretch cluster, two in each side, but now we have workload inside one, and we have other workload inside two running, and we have our volume for the or the, I think it's purple, uh, purple VMs, uh, they have their volume here, they are reading and writing in that volume here, and it's storage, it's user storage replica to get all the data to the other side, and vice versa, our red VMs have their volume here, and uh, writing and uh, reading data from this volume, and this is replicated to side one. So we can use the resources on both sides. Let's a bit cheaper scenario because we have active workload on both sides. They are equal. We don't have a, a, an active and a passive side. We have both sides. And to add here in Germany, what I've seen, I've never seen an active passive scenario. All the customers where I implemented stretch clusters mm. have an active active scenario. They want to use both, uh, both compute resources and the storage resources doesn't matter it's the same but both com uh, both uh both or all four compute resources or there could be even more resources you will talk about that uh in a in the later slide so we, they want to use all the compute resources for for the active workload usually the vms right so let me ask one question i mean um you know stretching a volume is you know you is optional, right? So, I mean, nobody obliges mm -hmm. you in order to stretch a volume. So can you do a mixed kind of setup where you say, hey, um, I got some servers on site number one, which needs to be replicated to the other side, but not all of it. Um, can I do that? Uh, you mean servers or VMs? Uh, VMs, sorry. Yeah, yeah. VMs. Virtual of course, you can servers. do that. Uh, very good question, by the way, because many people think if it's a stretch cluster, everything is stretched. No. Mm -hmm. You can have, for example, imagine this is not here. The storage replica uh, uh, thing is not here. You have a local volume, for example, if you have, let's say, exchange, and high available exchange installation. I know Microsoft says every exchange has to be in Office 365, <laughs> but there are still customers out there that, that do their own exchange, um, how it's called. Um, DAG, I think, the, uh, is it DAG? Yeah, uh, Exchange DAG. So you have one or two Exchange servers in this volume and the other Exchange servers here. And Exchange has its own replication mechanism. So you would not put the, uh, put the Exchange here, use a replication to another volume and then uh, copy the volume also. So there is maybe workload that has uh, redundancy in the workload itself, like SQL, Active Directory, Oracle databases, I think Postgres has the same SQL databases, or you have VMs, uh, let's say VDI. Yeah, we talked about uh, in, in our AV uh, Azure Virtual Desktop series uh, on Azure Stack HCI, we have maybe many worker VMs where, custom, uh, where users can connect to. So if one fails, we have maybe 10 others, so he, he can connect to another one. Why should I um, replicate this worker uh, VDI VM where every application is installed as in, uh, in the other nine is also all the same applications installed, it doesn't matter to which one the customer or the user connects. So why should I replicate those? Yeah. So as you said, we can have volumes that are only local to this side mm -hmm. and also volumes that are only local to this side and we put our workloads in there. And then we can have stretched stretched volumes where we have a workload that has not these uh, possibilities, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah a question, Bernard. Yeah, maybe in addition to that. So um, I like the idea of what you put out, which is, you know, if your application or your workload has its own geo redundancy mechanism, um, then use that or consider at least it, right? Uh, like exchange, like SQL server. Um, I also do have customers that are replicating their SQL databases using HCI. Um, however, I think it's still a very, very valid option to use SQL Server replication mechanisms like SQL Always On in order to do that. Um, 
and think of the geo redundancy from the application level, yeah. right? Especially um, if we talk of September 2023, right? We have an additional cost for the replication, and it's maybe more than you think. And we will talk about that because yep. this is not a this is not a marketing uh, series. It's uh, <laughs> for people who want to implement the stuff. And mm -hmm. there are some things you maybe have to know before you implement them. So stay with us. We talk about yeah. all all the good things, the fantastic things, but also about the bad things. Uh, right. um, at least I'm here for that. Uh, maybe Bernard, <laughs> no, you don't want to, to gamble with your job, right? So I do the bad things. <laughs> no, all good. Okay, I let's mean, do um, let, yeah, yeah, let's go, go to the go next ahead. one. I mean, we, we this is yours. Point. Yes. So, so uh, what is, you know, which options do you have at the moment? So four nodes stretched, having two nodes on one side, two on the other side is is supported, even three nodes. Um, this would give you the option in order, as far as I understood, to, you know, to do a three-way mirroring on mm -hmm. each of the sites, right? Uh, eight nodes are supported, but even more um, as far as I, um, as far as it's, it's listed. However, I mean, I would not recommend to go for such big clusters anyway, but uh, at least you can uh, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. And you can't Next. do 32 nodes now. We have still <laughs> the 16 nodes that are for Azure yeah. Stack HCI, but the they, the 16 in total mm. are are spread over the sides, right? So yeah, that's a good yeah, that's a good a good add on to this. So. Yeah. Um, I think there was more to it, right? Which is not supported, like two nodes or three nodes, or using any odd numbers of nodes, um, which would give you, you know, a, a, a non-equal count on either side. Um, and I think it's, yeah. you know, it, it it makes sense to to do it. Um, it's important um, because sometimes yeah. people say, if you think of the active-passive scenario, mm -hmm. you have one side that is where all the workloads are and the, the passive scenario is oh. only there if ever is there a failure so mm. people think maybe let's put not as powerful machines there let's put less machines there mm. yeah i heard that from customers and to be really clear and upfront an azure stack hci scenario is really uh how you call it it's it's the same number of nodes it's the same devices it's the same number of memory same same cores and so on yeah. uh you should do that and uh, i don't know if it's really a requirement with the cpus but uh, i would not go another way because maybe you decide no i want to have an active active cluster right yeah yeah, the setup okay. is delicate and you will see it, right? So uh, the last thing that I would recommend is to use a completely different or a hardware mix, right? So this is not yeah. something that I would recommend at all. And Good point, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So go for it. Okay, next slide. I think that was you again, um, where you yeah, talk a little bit again. About, about the Yeah, failing. we talk a bit about the witness uh, because mm -hmm. we saw on the side before, we have an, we have an equal number of nodes in each side. So it's always an, an even number of nodes. So if you have two on each side, we have four. If you have three on each side, we have six nodes in total mm -hmm. and so on. So the cluster has an even number of nodes. And if mm -hmm. you have an even number of nodes, imagine here, um, and that's really more possible in this scenario than in, Azure, in, in, in any Azure, other scenario, like an Azure Stack HCI, we have maybe, Site one is maybe in, let's say, in Hallenberg, and site two is in Regensburg, where Bernard is uh, is uh, mm -hmm. stationed, let's say. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we don't have many, many, many networks between them. We maybe go even over the internet somehow through a VPN or whatever. So there could be a network failure that these two sites can't see each other. Yeah. So, and uh, in this scenario, we, ha we would have two two votes here, two votes mm. here. So we have our, we don't have quorum. Let's say that we don't have a majority of nodes so that the cluster can decide, oh, I'm the majority. I will run my VMs and maybe start the other VMs. And the other part is a minority. It will shut down the VMs and uh, do nothing else. Yeah. So we have to have a witness in a stretched Azure Stack HCI scenario. So now imagine we have to have we, we need the, we need an un, an odd number of votes and the witness gives us us that so we have an uh, an even number of nodes in the cluster so we need another vote and that's our witness 
So we agreed we have to have a witness. Um, so now the question is where to place it. And in this scenario, this is from you, lucky you, great. In this scenario, our witness is in side one. So now mm -hmm. imagine yeah, side two fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. So before the failure, we have five votes. One, two, three, four, five. So now the witness, uh, the side two fails. So side one has a look. Yeah, I have two votes and I see the witness. Yeah? So I have three votes out of five. I, I have a majority, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, I can start the VMs that fails because this is one cluster. Every mm -hmm. node has a copy of the cluster database and it knows what is running on the other nodes. So it knows server three and four has these VMs running. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it can start the VMs now because we have, we have a copy of the data with the storage replication. We have exactly the data here. So it mm -hmm. will take this volume, bring it online before it was not online, but it was mm -hmm. there. Every write was there. It will bring it online, the copy mm -hmm. of the data, and then it, it can start the VMs. Fantastic. Yeah. All good. What we want. Lucky you. Yes. Lucky that's us. How we... So I do the, the bad part, and then you show us how to do it right. So mm -hmm. let's imagine not site two fails, site one fails. Mm -hmm. So we don't have our two servers, server one and server two. And our witness, it is placed in the same site. Mm -hmm. Or even worse, it's placed on a VM that is running on, on a server, server one or server two. So it will fail also. Mm -hmm. And now this site has to calculate again. It has one server, two servers, two, so two votes. It can't see the witness because it's gone. So it has two votes, but we had mm -hmm. five votes. So mm -hmm. two of five is not the majority. Our cluster mm -hmm. doesn't have quorum, so it is right. a minority. So it will do something that people don't imagine. It will not start the VMs that are now failed. But even worse, it has a major uh, minority, so it has to mm -hmm. shut down its own VMs. Mm -hmm. And we have no workload running anymore because mm -hmm. this site is in the minority. Do you have a question, Bernard? No, a no remark? question, just... Uh, just um... Yeah, no, uh, just an emphasizing, uh, which is, you know, might not be the expected behavior, right, of that cluster. But, you know, the witness is important and that's why we need to place it right. And that's uh, the next slide, right? So where do, are you putting or where should you, should you put the witness in order to have a referee or a gatekeeper? And that's the reason why you need to put it in a, in a third site, right? It could be an additional data center that has network connectivity to both ends, yeah. or uh, it could be, you know, placed in Azure as a cloud witness. Um, and the reason is, you know, in order to, you know, let's play it through. So let's start again with uh, site one, I think is failing. What ha uh, site two fails? Of course, right? it's site two, 50-50, um, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, site two fails. Uh, what happens? Site one sees the witness. Uh, it has the majority of votes. It will start the VMs on its uh, location, right? So all good. However, let's play the, the other way around. Um, and I think it's it's also obvious, right? So if site one fails, site two on the right hand side has, can talk to the witness. It has the majority. It will uh, prevent the previous case that Carsten was describing and start the VM, right? Um, so all good. Um, it's also, again, not rocket science, um, but um, you need to consider it, right? Uh, I, I want to add something because that the witness is not inside one or so, side two is if you talk with people about it, it's obvious you understand it because if the witness is gone, when that site fails, we, we explained it. But was also very important, and I will go back here to see it. Mm -hmm. We have to have independent connection to the other site. And of course, with Azure Stack HCI, I would I would take Azure and a cloud witness because we are connected to the cloud anyways. Mm. Uh, yeah, Azure is very redundant, uh, what we have there. So, but most people don't get this. In many scenarios, site two is, is communicating to site mm. three over site one. 
Yeah? Yeah. Or if you have Azure, not many people have independent connections to the internet on, uh, on both sides. Often, especially in smaller installations, the internet connection is in one side or they have only one, right? So if it's here in side one, you shouldn't do a stretch cluster at all because if site one fails and your witness is gone, the cluster does something you, you don't expect, everything is going down. So this is also an important part yeah. here, the independent connection to your witness from both sides. And uh, you, yes, you're right, because if I reconsider, you know, how many customers I talk to that have a central firewall or proxy where all of the traffic is passing through, especially the one with the internet traffic, then this is probably a thing that you need to test, right? Um, because yeah. it's not only a, a failover for a site maintenance kind of thing, right? I mean, what you want to prevent is... Um, is uh, or a, what you want to have is a geo redundant solution and therefore you need to test that it's really uh it's really uh working uh in the direction so the witness is very important in in, in that scenario um yes um let's yeah, go let's, to storage replica let's, yeah let's go to uh to the next one yeah and uh i i press the uh, arrow on uh it was not to to speed you up it was just uh, <laughs> uh, an arrow yeah so <laughs> So I do the so how does the, yeah, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, we have two scenarios or two kinds of replication. That was the the errors or the yeah the the data is moved over the replication to the other sides, and we have two kinds of replication. We have the synchronous. Of mm -hmm. course, we want synchronous replication, and uh, I will show you how it works. Uh, so uh, we have a let's say we have our application, our VM. Our VM is running here on the source side and uh, is writing data because reading data we we don't really care the data is not changed so we don't have to get some change to the other side reading doesn't change anything only the writes change data so we our application our vm is writing something to our source node and uh, the source node is replicating the data over the replica network using SMB3. Very mm -hmm. important, we use SMB3. Very powerful protocol. We can do multi-channel, so we can leverage multiple connections to get to the other side. Um, um, we can't use RDMA. That's a requirement in Azure Stack HCI. We will talk th about that in the networking part. So unfortunately, no RDMA, but uh, still, SMB3 is really powerful. Then we see here, we write at the same time the data where, where the at the same time where the data is replicated to the other side. We also write in a local log volume, mm -hmm. um, and on the destination side, as soon as the data arrives, it also is written to a log volume. So we have our data in the log volume on both sides. So now the data is on on not in memory it's really on on um, on non yeah it's 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 there on uh, on devices so if a power failure hits our data is still on the side so now the destination node uh, acknowledges that the data is written and the source node acknowledges the write to the application now the application knows okay my data is written i can do another write or whatever if that is done, now the data is copied from the log file to the to the data volume. Yeah? Mm -hmm. On this side, the data volume is online, and on this side, it's it's not online. We can't change the data volume here. This is only read only if you want to, but usually it's also not read only. And here you can read and write. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, so you see. We write on both sides. If the when the data is on both sides written in devices, we get the acknowledgement and we know the data is on both sides. So it's synchronous. Every mm -hmm. day, every write is done on both sides when the application gets uh, yes, your data is written. We have some requirements, of course. The network latency between the two sides should be low or very low. And uh, maybe well, you have well, a question. What is, what, is, what, is, what is very low? What is uh, so <laughs> in in latency in devices in storage devices? We usually talk about 
milliseconds or even sub milliseconds. So if you look at an NVMe, for example, mm -hmm. and we see many NVMe installations, we have maybe a latency below 0 0.1 milliseconds or maybe 0 0.2 milliseconds. So um, 200 microseconds. If you imagine here, the source is in Hallenberg and the destination would be in Regensburg, that is even 300, 400 uh, kilometers over the air. So usually it's not as fast as writing an NVMe. We would have maybe three, four, five milliseconds already here or yeah. even 10. So every mm. write of the application in addition to writing it to the volume that has already some latency, we add to every write the round trip time and the write here. So mm. if this is, for example, one millisecond to write the data here, we add another millisecond to write the data here. Yeah. Mm. And then the round trip time. So for, for Ring's book, maybe it's four, five, six, seven milliseconds. So our application slows down because of the synchronous replication. So we we need low latency or we have to do the other replication that will you explain very soon. Mm. And of course, the log volumes here have to be flash because mm -hmm. if that would be hard disk and nowadays mm -hmm. hard disk, if you need performance and if you do a stretch cluster and you don't need hundreds of terabyte usable space, go with flash devices. So you would have already flash devices also for the data, but the log file must be on flash. The data should be on flash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we have nowadays what i've seen in all my implementations the writing to the log the source log file takes its time it's it's how it's implemented so i see usually here a three millisecond um mm. delay while writing to the log file this is and the I source think, log file yeah, not so, this one this yeah one. yeah so two things right which uh, let me emphasize this so the network between the two sites is the critical piece, right? We can't go faster than the latency on this network, yeah, yeah. right? It's um, speed of light or whatever. Right, and also the devices that are in between, right? Because mm. we will see later that you need routers uh, for that and um, routing costs time. I mean, you mm -hmm. need to inspect the package and whatnot. Second thing, step number two is costing time. So there is a time penalty to this and we will see that even if you know the network between the two sites would be very thin very short and very fast you would still see that there is a performance penalty to this because of the way how the log file is currently implemented in 22h2 this is about to change in order to get more performant but as of now um this is this is the current state yeah. but we'll so, approve it and and see it and how the be yeah. behavior goes right so i've never seen it faster than three milliseconds the mm -hmm. the whole part here or the this whole part even if they are the, yeah. the source and destination are very near together we will talk about that so if your application is killed with three uh, three millisecond <laughs> latency this mm -hmm. is not for you at least not in september 2023 yeah, you have to consider that. Yeah? And there's maybe you talked about SQL Server. The way SQL Server does is always on magic. This is, of course, not depending on that. So, for mm. example, if you need a high performance SQL Server, that's maybe not what you want to do or should mm. do. Yeah? But let's let's talk about uh, the other way, because mm. usual people think, OK, synchronous yeah. replication is too slow for me. Let's do the other thing. And now you explain, please, the asynchronous. Yes. So uh, starting again with the two sites, right? Um, so the first step is the application is writing a block um, in, in the source system. Uh, the first thing that happens is it will be written into the log file, like, uh, like before, right? Um, however, the next thing is, um, a little is different from the previous behavior. The acknowledgement will be, you know, as soon as the data is written to the log file, it will be acknowledged back to the application. Application is fine and can go ahead, right? Then we replicate over the block using SMB to the other site, and then we will write into the log file again, and then the acknowledgement comes back, and then at some time later, the data 
uh, is written to or the block is written to the uh, to the data volume on both sides, right? However, I mean that seems to be faster, right? Um, still, we need to for the log volume. It is important. We need to have it on flash, but there is still a notable performance penalty to this, right? Because step number two is the one that takes some time, the three milliseconds that Carsten was explaining, you will see it here as well, right? So although you do asynchronous, it's not, you know, in some scenario, it's not, you know, it, it can't be faster than how, uh, how fast we can write to the log file, yeah. right? Um, and also this, the same mechanism applies here. It will also is subject to change to get more performant in the next version. Um, so stay tuned um, if you really need this, uh, but be aware that there is a performance penalty to this. At, or at least Microsoft is aware of that problem and mm. they are working on it. But if it's in the next version or the version after that, we will see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't really know as of now, but they are make, aware. Yeah. Yeah, and to make you know the people interested in what's coming on this session, right? Um, I think we are going to show how much it will be, right? Uh, or yeah, of course we will show that. We will not just talk about it, <laughs> but to be to be fair, if you have yeah. a a geo redundant cluster, yeah, maybe asynchronous replication brings you uh, an advantage because in mm. the moment this bill will be fixed with a log file. I'm pretty sure of it. When depends, but here. If you go 1,000 kilometers or yeah. 1,000 miles between the sites, you will have a noticeable uh, latency because of the network. So going asynchronous, the application writes the data to the log, and then you get the egg. That's very fast. It's even faster than that's. It's much faster than the synchronous. Yeah? Mm. So yeah. if you if your sites are too too uh, apart of each other, maybe asynchronous application is for you, and yeah. Of course, you don't have the guarantee that the same data is on both sides if the source size fails, but this replication is continuously. So it's not every five minutes or every 15 minutes like Hyper-V replica. It's just a little bit behind. So maybe it's a second behind or 50 milliseconds or five seconds, but you have still a very, very, um, a copy that is very yeah. uh, is not very different to the, your original data. So and I uh, would, better to have a copy that is very near yeah. to your original data than restoring a backup that is maybe six or eight hours old or even older, right? And you know, think of it. I mean, you still might have a ten gigabit lane between those two sites, which might be operated by someone else, not by you. Um, and if you experience some outages at some points, right, where you say, yeah, maybe I'm not trusting it fully to be 100% online, right, then this might also be a good, um, a good candidate for you. Because if you see some glitches in the network, right, what you don't want to have is to wait for the network in order to come back and, and tell you to, um, mm -hmm. to, to the application to, to finally acknowledge it, right? So you want to go ahead and probably, you know, for uh, that would be uh, a scenario to be used more often. Yeah. Okay. To not, to not get over the hour with the first yeah. <laughs> uh, video, we are already at 43 minutes. Um, mm. I, uh, I got to the next slide and we have two scenarios or two extremes, let's say, how we mm -hmm. can do a stretch cluster. Yeah. This is a slide from a Microsoft presentation. And in this slide, you see we have a we have a four node cluster. That's the minimum. It's stretched over two sides. And to be clear, one mm -hmm. part is, is in London and one is in Paris. So this is one extreme where mm -hmm. you're not even on the same continent. Um, yeah, it's the same continent because London is on the uh, on an island called Great uh, Great Britain, right? And uh, Paris is in France, and it's on the European main continent. I, I hope this is politically correct. I don't know it exactly, but uh, <laughs> um, um, London is on on an island, right? So yeah. uh, we have even water between those. And um, to be clear, um, this uh, Bernard, so these are roughly over the air 420 kilometers so but in miles it would be uh, around 300 miles i guess maybe yeah 300 miles 
maybe 280 miles, still a, a huge distance in Europe. And this would be through the air. So normally, if you go, uh, you, you don't go over the air. If you want to communicate from London to Paris, you will follow some cable. So that are, this is even longer and you have a latency here. So the, the data has to travel, let's say, 1000 kilometers. And that's already noticeable uh, with the speed of light. We, we usually are connected over a wide area network. Uh, not many customers have in, enough mon money to uh, to get a, or to, to uh, even install a direct line between Paris or a direct cable between Paris and London. Maybe there are, are some, there are uh, stock exchanges. Maybe they have these kind of uh, direct lines, but the uh, usual customer wouldn't. Um, and of course, if you are in London in a data center and in Paris, it's not unusual that you have different IP ranges for all your things in the data center, the networks we need, and even maybe for your workloads, because the firewalls in London have a different, you have different uh, internet connections here than here, and you use mm -hmm. different IPs here and here because the data has to come to you. Yeah, so this is one extreme where we have a very, or a far separated geo redundant cluster or even a country redundant cluster. Um, and now we have the other one that is Bernard talking about, right? Yeah. So, okay. What, what we usually see, I mean, uh, and, you know, it might be because, you know, we are, uh, don't have these kind of customers but you know what we usually see is a much smaller scenario where the uh, geo redundancy is sort of um, wanted to be reached on the same campus or maybe on two campuses that are less than 200 meters apart right so maybe you have uh, two different buildings where you put your hardware into in order to uh, be protected against some fire uh, fires or something like that or you want to be protected for power or uh, internet cable connectivity outages or something like that, right? So most of the time, the people are interested in uh, stretching, but not so far apart, right? So they have their uh, dedicated switches environment. They have, you know, they control the sites, they control the network, and maybe they also, you know, or, or most of the times stretch the VLAN, uh, VLAN on that uh, system, right? So, so they even share at some point in time, even the same IP address ranges, right? Or uh, that's, that's most of the times happening. So that's a little bit more the common scenario. So um, yeah. that I would to say. To give numbers right? to that, um... More than 80% of the stretch cluster scenarios I have done in Germany are around this, some maybe 50 meters, some 100 meters uh, between the rooms, the sites, even some customers have uh, containers for your service and so on. But I also have done a scenario that is over 10 kilometers and even a scenario that mm -hmm. is over 50 kilometers. Um, there are there, but usually, at least what we do or what's considered a stretch cluster in Germany is below one kilometer. And it's all, mm -hmm. the customer controls the whole environment, let's say mm -hmm. it that way. And you put, yeah. it, put it at stretched VLANs. We have the same IP addresses, same VLANs in both rooms or both uh, uh, both buildings, uh, yeah. So uh, we can do layer two between uh, the sides, yeah, and not uh, layer three. If we go over a wide area network, we usually do routing, and we need layer three. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So let's do the next slide, which is uh, are... your your grouping, right? So it might, yeah. you know, be before we uh, conclude the session here to, you know, do some definitions um, on yeah. what a stretch cluster could look like. So. Um, because I'm not really so we have we have both extremes. Let's say we have a 420 kilometer cluster or even a larger one, and we have a, a very narrow one. Uh, so I would I would call uh, the larger ones metro cluster. For we have uh, uh, different cities or even more. It's a large stretch cluster, or the distance between the two sites is has a certain amount of kilometers or miles, uh, usually over maybe 10 
or even over five, we are talking about several, sometimes hundreds of kilometers slash miles. Um, the network between the sites is most of the time a van, so the customer doesn't have a dedicated, uh, uh, it's not their own network or they have dedicated um, fiber between that. That's also possible, but uh, um, it's it's a van. Uh, not, we don't have many redundant network paths between the, between the, um, between the sites. Um, so usually if, if you go through a van, you maybe have one, maybe have two different ways to get, uh, to, to get from one side to the other. And uh, if it's really uh, far away, we maybe have different IP ranges for the workloads. And so in one side, you have a different uh, IP range and uh, router and DHCP servers and in the other side. And that's, of, of course, uh, you have to think about when I have a failover of a VM to the other side, now it has to use another IP address, how to do that. So that's oh. a completely other level. Huh? And then we have the, uh, I call it campus stretch cluster because campus like it's a, on, on the same uh, area of a company, for example. So campus, mm -hmm. we have two sites, they're on the same campus, some meters apart between maybe 50 and 800 meters. Maybe mm -hmm. even you have a customer who has two rooms that are separated by a, by a firewall. And this time I don't mean uh, the, a router that is inspecting the IP packets. It's a wall that can withstand a fire. So you have two different uh, rooms with, uh, where one can burn and the other not. And then you mm -hmm. maybe have only 20 meters or 10 meters. Yeah? Um, the networks between the sites are high-speed LANs, and we are talking 10 gigabits or more, 25, 50, 100, multiple 100 uh, uh, megabits. Uh, and we have often dedicated switches for our, our communication between the sites. So we have multiple ways. We have our core infrastructure that connects both sites and even maybe dedicated storage switches uh, for replication and our local storage. And we have plenty of redundant network paths because we own the network. We can do multiple VLANs for the different traffics. And of course, our workload has the same IP address in both in both sides. So if it's running on in, in one side or the other side, it doesn't matter. It's the same routers, the same uh, the same DHCP service, the same DNS service, whatever you have, the same AD controllers and so on. So uh, this is a very large scenario and this is mm -hmm. the, the narrow scenario. And I have to say this scenario is the most used scenario in at least Germany, uh, uh, maybe in the US, this is the most used scenario, but in Germany we have have this a lot. And I talk to other other people in other countries, even in Great Britain or in Austria, Switzerland, whatever. Mm -hmm. You have often this campus stretch cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and to be to be really clear, as of September 2023, for both stretch cluster scenarios, the narrow one and the very large one. The only supported Microsoft solution is the Azure Stack HCI stretch cluster that we show in this series. There are other ways how to separate wo uh, workloads, how to separate Azure Stack HCI nodes, how to separate storage spaces direct H uh, nodes even. These are not supported by Microsoft. Yeah? At the moment. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it's not supported. And that's very important if you call microsoft support with a problem in your stretch cluster you have to have an azure stack hci cluster with two pools and with uh, with a storage replica between the sites to uh, to have a supported scenario mm -hmm. bernard you want to yeah. add something to that yeah um, this is you know the status from september 2023 it might change but it might not change right uh, so stay tuned but um, as of now um, this is something that you, when watching the series, need to check uh, independently, right? Because at this time, um, what Carsten said is correct. HCI uh, stretch cluster is the only answer to both of these scenarios, right? At the moment. Um, I think but... this was the, the longest video in the whole series <laughs> with 55 yeah. minutes. Yeah. So in the next video, we talk about the network and uh, what you have to install before. So I hope 
we see yes. you still there and yeah, uh, yeah. this is uh, also let, important right let, let, let me add a little bit to that so um we are not starting from scratch with everything right so we did a 23 videos on installing hci we are reusing or you know some parts of it that doesn't mean we are copying it we're just you know forwarding you to watch uh this series uh if you wonder how to get the operating system installed on the nodes our case would be, you know, the OS is installed, they are they are domain joined, but we tell you how the networking looks like. Um, and that's part of the next video. So be aware that there is more to, um, more uh, more stuff or more content laying around that you need to, to reference. Okay. Okay. So see I you would the say, next one. see you in the next one for the networking.